Okay, great. We are live to today's panel discussion. Today we want to discuss um, the carbon markets and the impact of the blockchain technology that, that, that it can have on, on the carbon markets. Um, at the beginning of the year, um, we had already mentioned that uh, real world assets might become a very big topic for 2023. Uh, has become already uh, quite more relevant, I think, in the past years with uh, certain regulation that has passed. And for today, as I said already, um, carbon markets will be the main objective. And for that, I have four experts invited to today's panel. Um, we will start now with a quick introduction round and maybe Christian, um, quickly present yourself. Yeah, thanks, Christian, uh, for the kind opening and thanks for having me here uh, today. My name is Christian Hübner. I'm running the Regional Project Energy Security and Climate Change of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation Asia Pacific. And yeah, I'm working since many years uh, in the field of climate and energy policy and governance. And uh, all this time I have really interested in blockchain uh, technology and, and how is this related to sustainable uh, developments uh, uh, from the energy perspective, from the climate perspective. And uh, I really uh, interested currently in the field of carbon credit markets where I see a huge uh, uh, potential for uh, climate protection. Thank you, Christian. The next we have Wolfram. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Happy to be here. My name is Wolfram Enza. I am co-founder and COO of Particular. And with Particular, we have developed a data platform, comparison tool, and rating system for tokenized green assets. So um, carbon is one of the main focus uh, areas we have right now, but we also cover um, uh, renewable energy certificates on chain, uh, water credits, biodiversity credits, uh, green stable coins that are backed by carbon. So there's a, a whole lot of uh, uh, new digital environmental assets that we all cover in our database. So in a way, we are operating um, like a regular ESG database uh, provider, like Sustainalytics or MCI or Moody's, but uh, we're not rating corporations. We're focusing on those green assets. And uh, why did we uh, develop particular, well, um, we felt that there is um, a missing link in the value chain uh, because there is not a go-to place where corporations and financial institutions can go to to get a full holistic 360 degree uh, view on tokens. Um, you know, there are places that describe the environment, but um, aspects like regulation, uh, compliance, security, taxation, and many more are missing. And uh, yeah, happy to be here. Thank you, Wolfram. And next we have Maximilian. Thanks for inviting me. Always happy to talk to you. So I'm Max. I'm Executive Director of the European Carbon Offset Tokenization Association. It's ECOTA in short. We are a think tank and we are an educator, around, uh, educator for society around the entire topic of regenerative finance, so refi, with a special focus on carbon offsets. Um, so we are an association combining minds like uh, Wolfram and then um, and maybe in the future also the other Christian in this panel on the topic. Um, maybe one sentence how I got to, into the topic. I bought my first cryptocurrency in 2019. So I took the on-ramp that probably most of us took. And since then I went down the rabbit hole and always thought, okay, are there any, any other use cases where blockchain technology like the real technology has any additional value other than like integrating it into DeFi, for example, um, or to doing a back loan in Aave. And hopefully, um, I'm pretty biased in this, but I think I found uh, another use case in uh, tokenized carbon credits. So very happy to talk about uh, the uh, the investment case and the use case today. Mm -hmm. Like one little thing I can also add to this, like, uh, Maximilian and me, we both attended the same university. And actually, the university has a focus on two things. I think one is renewable energy finance, and the second one is blockchain. So there's also a perfect intersection for both. And then last but not least, uh, Dan. Hi, thank you, Christian, for the invitation. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, I'm Dan Graff. Um, I'm the CEO and a co-founder of EarthChain. And we're a, a technology platform dedicated to embedding the funding of climate action into everyday business processes. And our primary focus really is embedding climate action into payments. So we all pay for things. We all use credit cards and debit cards. And what I would love to see, my dream, is that every time we buy something, we also fund a climate project in some way. Um, not taking it from necessarily the offsetting point of view, simply from contribution. 
Um, and so we built the EarthChain platform to enable this. And um, we're a startup. We are in the process now of going to market. And it's a very exciting time for us as a business. And we're seeing more and more payment providers getting very interested in this type of solution. There are some pioneers out there who've done things like this already. And we want to, we want to make it possible for any payment company to do uh, climate action built into every payment. And the reason that blockchain plays a role for us is because a typical consumer purchase, we're not talking about tons and tons and tons of carbon. We're talking about grams and kilos. And yet, even at that level, we want to have absolute transparency, absolute meticulous accounting and auditing of the climate action. So we chose blockchain as a solution for that. And I think maybe we can elaborate on these types of UK during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, for me, it's always great, I have to say, because I'm always learning a lot on these uh, type of panel discussions, especially when it's a topic that I'm not so familiar with. So it's great to have four experts here, uh, really in the field of carbon markets and uh, carbon, mar uh, carbon credits trading. And um, I think our audience is probably already quite familiar with some crypto topics, let's say everything around Bitcoin and Ethereum, but carbon credits is probably something new to them. And um, so maybe let's start um, with a very basic question at the beginning. Um, and uh, maybe Maximilian, you could um, um, answer that one. Um, what is actually a carbon credit and uh, do they differ and maybe how do they differ? All right, maybe let's start with what is actually a carbon credit. So um, think about a business that produces something, for example, laptops. Um, there are carbon emissions um, in, well, there's pollution in the entire value chain, right? If you want to come up with, for example, um, the keyboard, for example, you need materials for this and they have to be sourced. So in the value chain of a, um, of a company, there are carbon emissions produced. And right now they're currently not avoidable. So if as a, as a business, if you want to do something good for the world and become carbon neutral, for example, you could reach out to other businesses that are either carbon uh, negative, or you can set up your own project, for example, the forestation project to offset your entire value chain to become a carbon neutral um, business model. Um, now you could do this yourself, or you can go to the market and say, for example, hey, there is a forestation project in Brazil, for example, um, and this the forest that the project in Brazil um, builds um, cuts out as many tons CO2 equivalent out of the air as they want to. Um, I want to buy the part that they cut out from the atmosphere, for example, and integrate it into my value chain. So that would be one way that you can become carbon neutral or even carbon negative if you buy more credits than you pollute, for example, as a business. So maybe this, this is um, on a basic level what a carbon credit is, very high level. And if you want to now, if you want to buy a carbon credit, you have two markets in front of you. You have the compliance market and you have the voluntary market. Maybe that's take a brief look into the compliance market first. And one of the most prominent examples for this is the uh, European Union Emission Trading Scheme. It's EU ETS in short. So this is allowance-based, for example. Um, so the European Union sets a cap for um, the emissions in the entire European Union that should be emitted um, and allocates carbon credits according to this cap. This cap is going down over, uh, over time. And businesses can trade these carbon credits between themselves or between, um, or between other interested parties. Now, the compliance market, the EU ETS only covers like 40% of the entire um, carbon emissions uh, done in the uh, European Union. So if you want to do something carbon negative, really, you should look at the voluntary carbon market. So these are the projects that I just mentioned. For example, the project in Brazil, um, building the project and selling this to European investors, for example, that would be in the voluntary carbon market. Now, if you ask me about, okay, how do the carbon credits differ in the voluntary market? The honest answer is at every single step of the value chain. So in the projects themselves, is the quality of a forestation project in Brazil, for example, comparable to algae planting in a European sea, for example? Is the quality the same? I don't know. Um, now, carbon credits can be tokenized or cannot be tokenized. Is there a difference in tokenized carbon credits? I think, obviously, but obviously biased in this. So um, is there... Um, um, a difference in there or how is the uh, progress of the uh, project monitor there are so many differences in the voluntary carbon market and this is why we as ecota try to educate the public or try to educate buyers okay what steps of the value chain should you really focus on to have a valid and, an, um, and a high integrity carbon credit mm -hmm. thank you maximilian yeah this was already quite interesting i have to say because uh, the first thing that i was thinking about was uh, nfts because as you said, many different characteristics, right? 
Wir können heute kurz auch wie es Token Standard, Standard. Another one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, then maybe we can already go right away to the to the next question. Um, which projects generate most of the carbon credits, and who are typically the buyers and the sellers? Maybe uh, Wolfram, you could answer that one. Yeah, sure. Well, well, first first of all, in terms of market size, Max was was talking about it. Um, the um, A compliant market is is much much bigger. I believe in 2021 uh, the entire trading volume of the compliance market was around 850 billion US dollar, and at the same time the voluntary problem market was was just one billion. So I mean, just just to give you an idea of the size of those markets. Now um, within those um, credits, um, uh, in general, uh, Max was talking about the different categorizations. Um, uh, Avoidance credits um, are one category versus removing credits. So if I, for example, avoid with my uh, investment that a rainforest somewhere in South America is being cut down, then I can uh, get uh, credits for that. And 95% um, of all credits in the voluntary power market at this point are um, avoidance credits. They're all, all good and they are needed and they are important. Um, but uh, we kind of like need to uh, shift slowly but surely to removal credits because if we want to reach the, the climate goals, um, then it's it's not just about avoiding, but it's really uh, about removing uh, carbon from the atmosphere, and and that's um, that's a big differentiator. And then I would say um, uh, another separation when you ask like who's generating the most um, uh, credits, um, probably nature-based. Solutions, so afforestation, reforestation, um, you know, those types of projects, and then probably um, renewable uh, energy certificates are, are also a big tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, like from, from from the buyer side, it's uh, it's mostly like probably in heavily industrial companies or. Sure, sure. I mean, that, that brings the topic of uh, regulation uh, into the picture. Um, uh, I think in this case, regulation is a good thing because if there isn't um, pressure from uh, the government, the chances that companies would voluntarily act uh, on, uh, sustainably is probably slimmer. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, the, the corporate world, um, just as Max explained it, you know, has to offset the emissions that they can avoid. So the corporate world is a big driver, but there's also um, a growing uh, interest just on the general public population. So um, climate awareness is increasing, and that's, for example, the kind of solution that, that Dan was talking about that we are addressing. Which, which is, I think is a really good thing, you know, because uh, I, I I never blamed my parents, but, uh, you know, I, I always asked them, how, how was it about you guys when you were younger about saving the climate? And they were like, yeah, obviously we want to save the climate, but there was not too many efforts, you know, and I think it's very good that right now, I think it's, it's, it's a joint effort and we all have to come together. You know, we have to put our differences aside. And um, I think, yes, I think we, we see right now quite some progress. And um, I will also ask Christian about that later in regard to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. But before maybe Dan, um, could you um, talk a little bit about the role of institutions like uh, VERA and gold standards? Uh, what, what role do they play in the uh, voluntary uh, carbon markets? Well, these are two big names that are very well known in the space and they are known as registries primarily, okay? So what Gold Standard and VERA do, they register the carbon credits that are issued by the projects that are implementing the decarbonization on the ground. They make them available in the resolution of one ton in their registries, respectively. And um, they help to some extent to track when carbon credits are issued and when carbon credits are retired. The second aspect of what they do is they also provide um, certification methodologies as well, so that when a project wants to issue carbon credits, that they follow a particular methodology that ensures that what they're doing is of a sufficient quality, that it can be externally audited according to that framework, um, and that it can be demonstrated through evidence that uh, the, the work that they're doing to either avoid CO2 emissions or remove CO2 from the atmosphere um, can be recorded. And that's not to say that the methodologies are 
necessarily perfect. We cannot assume that the carbon market and carbon credits themselves are perfect. And I think that's a fallacy that has tripped up quite a few people um, recently, um, particularly with things like nature-based carbon removal that, that Wolfram mentioned a moment ago. It's actually very, very difficult to measure how much CO2 a plantation of trees is removing from the atmosphere over time. Um, it's very, very intense in terms of the amount of work that it takes. And while I feel that the methodologies that these institutions have developed over the years are better than no methodology and having a registry is better than no methodology, we also can't expect these processes to be perfect. And I think that some of the work that's being done now in the blockchain space and some of the ways that we can integrate other technologies, and I think we'll probably cover them later in the panel, um, are helping to improve the quality that the methodologies record and report. And Gold Standard and Vera, they're not the only registries out there. There are actually a number of them as well, including some up and coming registries who are looking at new types of methodology. Um, for example, things like removing carbon using processes such as biochar, where biomass is uh, combusted in the absence of oxygen and locks in carbon into biochar, which is a very stable form. Um, registries like Puro Earth, for example, are now taking those methodologies to market as well and enabling uh, participants who are working in agriculture or who are working in things like forestry to create these uh, biochar resources as well, these assets, and uh, and bring those to the market as well. So it's it's a moving space, but Vera and Gold Standard are very much the uh, the OGs, as the young people like to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah, th this gave me already quite a good overview about uh, how the voluntary market is currently uh, set up. And then um, I very much like that we have basically three uh, Web3 natives. I know that, Christian, you're also very familiar with, with all the ongoings, but I know that you also have a particular interest in basically the politics um, behind it. And maybe you could like um, tell us a little bit about how like the carbon credits market and uh, the Paris Climate Agreement um, maybe are connected. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, indeed, uh, from, from my... my uh personal interest, uh, I really have a close look and uh, monitoring the uh, policy landscape and climate politics all around the world. And the Paris Agreement was probably one of the major milestones the last uh, years we have, which is triggering an, a lot of uh, new policies and developments all around the world. If we uh, take, for instance, the mandatory carbon markets, which are currently increasing all around the world, we have it especially in Asia, where I'm currently working, uh, I see a lot of countries now really thinking and uh, already implement a new uh, mechanism for uh, the pricing of carbon. Um, and, and most of them, that is very interesting, are uh, directed to some kind of uh, carbon trading mechanism. So the last big thing happened, for instance, in China, which will probably be uh, one of the biggest uh, carbon uh, uh, trading markets in the world in the next years. Um, interesting is that India is really currently exploring to implement its own emission trading system, which probably is not fixed yet. But what I heard so far and read is that will be more characteristic to a voluntary carbon market uh, for the industry. Uh, and there are a lot of other countries, for instance, in Southeast Asia, who are uh, currently implementing or thinking um, how to uh, price their carbon emissions uh, with some kind of carbon uh, emission trade system. And that's a very, very promising uh, development uh, at all. At the same time, um, I think the dynamics between the Paris Agreement and voluntary carbon markets are very, very important. We really should an eye on this because what is currently um, discussed within the uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, where the framework of, uh, of carbon trading between the member state of Paris of the Paris Agreement will be defined. So the question is how member states can maybe trade uh, carbon uh, reduction uh, between and who other stakeholders can do this. And what is interesting here is here that um, a, a new market uh, like the clean development me mechanism is, uh, is, is, is currently under construction. This is very similar to, to the voluntary carbon markets and which will define some kind of space how the member uh, countries of the Paris Agreement can trade uh, the private sector of the private sector can trade with each other uh, with carbon credits. And uh, interesting here, of course, is uh, uh, the question: What kind of standards, certification, uh, reporting, 
uh, are they going to define in the future to make this uh, trading happening? And I think all this discussion will definitely adapt it in some or the other way uh, from the fully uh, voluntary carbon market. They can't ignore it in the future. They have to adapt to it because it's a huge market. If you really want to jump into it and the industry or the financial player are doing their uh, investment. Actually, this is a bit my, my personal uh, explanation why we do have carbon credits is the only reason is because we need some investment in climate protection. That's actually the the, the initial existence reason why we have them, right? Um, and and this is the most important thing here. And what I can see is that um, interesting now the discussion on the Paris Agreement is uh, 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 is as well. So will we? which kind of carbon credits will be allowed. So, and there are some governance who says, okay, we don't want carbon credits, which are um, counting on future avoidance. This, if this is not would be allowed, it would be crushed to the voluntary carbon markets a, a lot. So this is interesting mm -hmm. dynamics I see, which we have to keep in mind. There's some reason why we, why, why the governance thinks it because we want real carbon uh, reduction uh, achieved, uh, which is the final goal of the Paris Agreement. And this is why I think it's very really interesting things and discussion are currently going on. And the overall issue, why I am now jumped again a bit more into the blockchain uh, uh, technology, I think they can provide. A, huge benefit to solve a lot of problems in this voluntary carbon market. So we have this complexity, we have this inefficiency, we have uh, the, 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 these, uh, we have some certification problems. And uh, I think the blockchain technology can uh, provide a lot of benefits to overcome these problems. And uh, this is a bit why I think this policy and, and climate, international climate is really important, bring it together. Mm -hmm. So, so, so my takeaway is um, basically that we will see or that we are already seeing more uh, government Im involvement. So basically that more like the, the, all, the, all the different countries around the world are becoming more interested in the carbon markets. And uh, your also other takeaway was that uh, you think that blockchain is a great uh, playing ground to basically um, harmonize like the rules for, for all the different players, which I agree because... Um, this is my, my personal opinion, but for example, in the case of Bitcoin, um, I have promoted that before the idea that basically the, the rules for everybody on the Bitcoin blockchain are the same, whether you're a big bank in, uh, insurer or whether just a retail investor and just having like these, these norms and rules which are just equal to everybody is just, I think, this kind of playground that exactly sort such kind of markets um, need to, to basically flourish. Uh, maybe and then yeah Max? maybe to chime in on that uh, i mean this is a good bridge to what we talked about earlier i mean wolfram mentioned that most of the market pre tokenization was otc so you called up your like trader and you said okay what's the standard, standard uh, for this what is this registered with and if you really talk about or really think about what is blockchain actually good at it's providing transparency and alongside the entire value chain over continents over currencies over languages and um, Dan talked about how Vera and Gold Standard, which are not, they are not uh, blockchain natives, right? They do carbon credits in that sort of like a legacy way. And I don't say it as a negative way, but they do legacy carbon credits. So if we want to integrate, if we want to bring transparency into the entire value chain, okay, where's the project coming from? Who, where is it registered with? Is it already retired? And especially if you talk to institutions, they want to know the entire value chain because it's, it can be a huge PR disaster if you buy a Brazilian forest and a journalist picks up the phone or buys a plane ticket, flies to Brazil, and the forest isn't there. Um, blockchain provides these kind of transparency and, uh, um, alongside the entire value chain. And this is why, I mean, I talked about this into, in my introduction. There's a real use case and a real added value of integrating blockchain into a process that is already in the legacy world, right? So this is so like an enhancement of an already existing uh, process. And um, Christian, you talked about if futures, for example, so these are futures for me, right? So if you disallow futures, for example, that would crush the entire VCM, especially the very important nature-based project that Wolfram mentioned, because most of the farmers, for example, they don't have the money to do the forestation project, for example. They want to sell their project to an investor. Most of them are in the Western world. And if they are not allowed to do this because forest isn't there yet um, so co2 emissions reductions in the future that would hurt the entire market i think and that would that would be very crushing to um yeah to our to our market and to the good of our future and this is why uh, we need more education about the entire uh, added value that blockchain brings to the table if we talk about tokenizing 
uh, carbon credits which exist in the real world in the, the sort of like legacy world mm -hmm. so so i take like two things a um, blockchain is a, a great venue for carbon markets trading but the second aspect that maybe not everybody um, like has pictured before was that there's also a lot about reporting right that basically you can like mirror the whole value chain from basically the beginning until the end and I, do i understand that correct yeah this is so like the utopia right so one once in like in 10 or 20 years even the reporting and the measurement for example satellite data is on chain for a specific token for a specific carbon credit i think the market isn't there yet so we need um so like players who actually do so humans who, for example, go to the forest. Uh, I'm just putting the forest here because avoidance projects are very um, uh, abstract. So let's stick with the nature base here. So humans can actually verify, okay, is the forest standing there? How is the CO2 um, captured from the air? But even in even with humans, and then talked about this, we do not have. Uh, so the entire market is very small, and the entire market it's very fragmented. We don't have standards on okay, how 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 do we measure this? And if we talk to institutions that have millions of sustainability budget. They will buy up two or three projects all at once. Um, so how can you pool them, for example? Or how is the price impact? If if I buy an entire project, the price impact will be huge and I will get less for my money. So there's so much to think about if we want to integrate or scale this market up, integrate it um, for institutions so that, like, that you could compare it to a traditional commodities market like oil, for example. So much um, scaling pains where I think blockchain technology can very um yeah at, at very much to the table in terms of price discovery integrity and transparency and standardizing the entire thing to make it more attractive to institutions because only institutions will scale the market mm -hmm. max let me actually um add one point uh, and that is um uh, efficiencies because uh, if you also just look at the time that it takes that currently um uh, credits are traded over the counter uh, i mean it it has several middlemen involved that's in, another Thing that just you know not just takes time but also money uh, which which you pointed out i mean you you never know how many cents of your dollar really end up with uh, the project but it can take weeks just for a simple uh, retirement so um for a second leaving blockchain aside i think what even the um the big players in the in the legacy market um, realized is uh, that they need a serious upgrade. Uh, they need uh, to be digitized, you know, and, and there are certain solutions and blockchain is kind of like the, the, the underlying uh, back end uh, innovation that um, has the biggest potential, uh, you know, being the database, so to speak. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes we like to prefer talking about uh, digitalizing uh, the voluntary power market because uh, not everyone is so fond of the term uh, blockchain. I'm sure that's another topic we will get into. You know, for for a lot of people that don't know the topic, crypto, blockchain, and all of the other uh, news they read is all the same, and that that unfortunately um, hurts uh, hurts the industry. So long story short, it's about digitizing and making it more efficient. Interesting there, there, Wolfram, as well. That that's a good point about the the legacy, um, or let's say you know, main players at the minute, your gold standards and your Vera. Um, they are looking into tokenization technology at the moment on a number of fronts. And I can speak probably more on what's happening at Gold Standard since my company, Earthchain, were involved in that process with them as well. First of all, just going back to that monitoring, reporting and validation, um, Gold Standard certification part, um, Sustainsa are currently piloting digital MRV methodologies now, which is quite exciting, very interesting. Um, looking forward to see how that progresses. There are certain types of credits, as you said, which are easily uh, able to be done automatically using, you know, for things like renewable energy, you just know how many kilowatts are coming out of the generator, that's straightforward. But for forestation projects, it's a lot more difficult. And you can, you know, use some degree of electronic sensing, you can use remote sensing from space, LIDAR data, you know, this, this kind of reading the vegetation from the land from above can go so far, but you do need to have boots on the ground. Um, so it will be interesting to see how that progresses. So yeah, Sustainsa is, is making moves there. And the other thing is, well, the other you know aspects of it is the tokenization part. And uh, both Gold Standard and Vera put a halt to any efforts to do tokenization of their carbon credits um, following one incident that we may wish to get to, into later in the discussion where um, 
perhaps things run a little out of control and worried the registries about the reputation of the entire market, which I think is, is a reasonable thing to do. But rather than stop there and say, okay, no, this is never going to happen, both of the major registries, both Vera and Gold Standard, created consultations and working groups and said, okay, this is something that we need to look at. We need to get into this and we need to understand a little bit more because they recognize the benefits that this can bring if done properly. So um, our company, Earthchain, now is currently working together with Gold Standard and four other companies in the digital carbon market um, to go through what we're calling a readiness phase. And this is a process of discussing where the boundaries are, discussing the requirements for things, um, you know, like what it would need for a company to be able to come online and begin to tokenize a carbon credit into a digital asset. Basically setting the framework for where this could potentially take place if the registry wishes to take it forward in future. Um, and that's a position of privilege that I'm very glad that we're on board with. And it's great to be on board with Thalo, Flow Carbon, Bit Green, and Toucan as well, all big names in the uh, in the voluntary carbon market digital uh, game, let's say. And um, so I'm very pleased to see that they're embracing the future and uh, and not completely uh, re rejecting it in any way. It's uh, it's good. It's progressive, and I like it. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's also for me like a very good sign that uh, basically they they are inclined to basically um, yeah, support blockchains. But I think everybody has to first to come up with some kind, kind of concept, right? On how do you want to integrate it? And um, yeah, because my, my background is mostly in DeFi. And I can assure you that in DeFi, things are very often rushed. And uh, whether it's like Luna or some other kind of things. It might have been better really to come up with like a really good concept right from the beginning and then basically pursue it then um yeah just to rush things so, but i think that's great and um i hope that you can also maybe later give more insights on um yes what are like the ideas or like what's the stand of um gold standard in regard to, to tokenization um, maybe now uh, because you already mentioned tukan um, i would really like um, that we uh, could name some of the really big players um, in the in the Web3 space um, who are right now uh, some of the biggest uh, trading venues who are, I don't know, the biggest tokenizers. Uh, maybe you guys can give a quick overview about what are some names that uh, definitely worth a look at. Anybody I, can, I, can pick, yeah. I can pick this up. I mean, I think it all all um, started with um, Tukan. You know, they were really like the, the first player who who proved that um, technically uh, it is possible to kind of like you know uh, migrate those legacy credits and bring them uh, onto the blockchain. Uh, as Dan had pointed out, um, not everyone was uh, excited because the way that was done is um, they um, kind of like retired the credits in the uh, in this case vera registry and kind of like brought them on chain uh, onto a blockchain registry and, and uh, again then had said like you know for good reasons uh, vera was not too excited about it because uh, from their point of view those credits um, didn't reflect um, the correct status but um uh, yeah, they were definitely the one i think they took more than 20 million uh, credits out in total and they proved and that was a starting point that you know um, uh, the benefits in general were all uh, valid um, some things didn't go so well i mean if you're uh, a super early adopter or the the innovator in this case then and, you know, you, you have to live with uh, maybe uh, the blame for things that didn't go so well. They were criticized a little bit um, for, um, you know, taking old credits out that weren't selling on the, on the, um, uh, on the traditional market. But uh, over, overall, I think they, they, they started this process and they are still a big name in the industry. I don't know, Dan, you, want, you mentioned a few more. You want to kind of like add on to that? You're, you're, you're in the middle and... Yeah, absolutely. Well, from I think just you know to, to the point, I think the, the the piece about taking the old credits off um, the market actually was quite a decent piece of activism in terms of making them unavailable to other players, so that they're forced into buying higher quality credits. And my understanding is that that was the driver behind the action. That was the goal. Um, it was. It was it was interesting, an interesting experiment. The price took a very wild ride, and 
uh, you know, it went all the way up to, I think, if I remember correctly, over $3,000 through Klima Dow, who, um, who was sort of operating uh, operating that model, um, which is, is remarkable, but it, it maybe gave the more legacy players in the industry the vibe of a crypto pump and dump style, something or other, which, uh, you know, I have no perspective or point of view on on exactly how that shook down it's not something that i was involved in but you know it was it was an experiment and when you really shoot for the moon and i'm talking in terms of you know nasa style shooting for the moon not like dogecoin to the moon style <laughs> shooting for the moon um you're going to take risks and you know people are going to get their fingers burned and you know shit happens it was good. It was good that that happened because it woke the legacy registries up as well, Definitely. which is why we find ourselves now working in perhaps a more structured way, hand in hand with those registries to uh, to establish something that's perhaps going to be more stable going forward. And so to the point, I would say, um, let's look at some of the, the peers that we're working with on, on that topic, on the readiness phase with, with gold standards. You know, one in particular, they're actually quite local to us here in the UK, Thalo. Um, they're building an on-chain um, carbon trading platform, and they're already live with um, with some projects. And yeah, I think that's I think that's a very exciting um, piece of work there. They're uh, they're well funded and uh, they're moving forward very nicely. And they're a great bunch of guys. Good to talk to as well. Um, as well, you know, two kind of working with us on there. I think Wolfram, you covered them as well. Um, and then we've got Big Green. Um, project run by uh, Adam Carver out of New York City. And um, I think they've been integrating climate action on chain through um, interesting user experiences, such as uh, video games and this kind of thing, which is quite interesting too. That's uh, that's exciting as well. And then I think potentially one of the, the biggest players in uh, in the group of companies who are working together with Gold Standard are obviously Flow Calvin as well. Um, so they're I guess of the five of us, the the biggest of them at the moment in the market, and um, yeah, they've uh, they've been doing some great work as well. Um, I think between us, from from what I've understood by what we've exchanged, we all see a need for regulation in the space. We don't think it can function as a wild west. It's just too risky for the registry and for anybody who wants to participate in the market. So I think. You know, any pure utopian DeFi dream of being completely permissionless and completely anonymous isn't going to be the outcome here. Honestly, mm. I think we're talking about trading an asset and we're talking about trading an asset in the real world. And we want this to be available to corporates and we want this to be available to financial institutions. And there is no getting around things like KYC and there's no way of getting around things like auditing and, and regulation as well. So I think that's the way the wind is going to blow. I'll say that now. Um but it's a work in progress. And, you know, as time progresses, Gold Standard will publish their outcome and uh, and their decision. And their decision may also be that they won't proceed. That's entirely their prerogative. Um, but the journey is interesting and we're exploring the space um, in some considerable depth, let's say. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can pick, pick up here to I like this work in progress and journey issue because this is really a, the, the case currently. I see it by myself when I watch you do this uh, development. So uh, there will be a, a lot of more ups and downs. So uh, we, we have seen uh, the issue of reputation is extremely important of carbon credits. So we know the Paris Agreement is demanding from governments to improve the climate protection targets. The governance pushing is down to the companies who are creating net zero targets. And everybody is now thinking to carbon credits as a solution to all, which is actually not the case. There are other solutions too. Um, but what I think is important for the carbon, the tokenization process of carbon credits and the whole market structure, which uh, it's a huge market, very diverse stakeholders and 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 uh, big big networks behind it. Uh, it's important as the quality of data. We talked about the digitization of the digital measurement report and validation process, because blockchain, if you want really to gain all the benefits from blockchain technology, you need to be able to take care that all the, quality, the data which you put in have a high degree of quality because otherwise we gain this garbage in garbage out problem. So and that's why I think this digital measurement and report and validation process is extremely important. It can really improve the quality of data in terms of nature-based solution or technical solution uh, and other. I think there's a huge uh, 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 potential in here. On the other side, uh, what we have to, and, and or the other side, what we have seen the last month, there was a big scandals going on about the quality of carbon credits, uh, which 
was quite a reputation damage uh, for some companies who are involved in this. Uh, whether it's true or not, I, I'm not sure. So there, everybody has, has tried to do their homework and, and do have uh, increased high standard and certification procedures. But certification is as well some kind of very, very sophisticated science. So I have done uh, as well working in uh, with ecosystem service and economic analysis of ecosystem services. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a tricky issue. You, make, you do a lot of assumption about the future, which you can't control, you know, because politics is involved and, and, and politics can change from one to the other day. And that can really change scenarios for the future, which might be the basic for some credit, uh, carbon credit, which are generated. That's really important to have in mind here. Uh, and we have seen uh, earlier the issue of greenwashing, of something firms who work with some kind of uh, carbon credit, for instance, has to deal with. Uh, so they have to buy really high quality carbon credits. Now we face some kind of green hushing. So companies have to take care, because feel a bit embarrassed or ashamed because they have some kind of carbon credits, but they don't really understand them maybe and don't really know the whereabout, what, what is the crucial impact behind it. So this is uh, uh, something I think the whole uh, tokenization process of carbon uh, credits will have to take into account as well in the future, especially if we face all this recent developments is pooling of carbon credits to make it more efficient, more liquid, uh, which is uh, make things as well a bit abstract. You don't really see uh, the, the real the real um, benefit for the environment down there if you walk into this uh, crypto markets in the DeFi space, for instance, where everything is a really fluid, you know? So this is something I think we have to really uh, keep in mind as well here um, to really take all the advantage of the tokenization of carbon credits. Maybe mm -hmm. to add on that, um, I think the entire value chain of a car tokenized carbon credit um, will never be entirely blockchain native because we need people at the very start of the entire value chain who, in my utopia, do nature-based projects. So, for example, plant the algae or do a forestation project. And we need uh, like a demand. So at the very end of the, pro um, of the value chain uh, for people to buy these and retire these or integrate this into a business model. So... If you compare this to DeFi, for example, DeFi, it's, for me, it's pure math. So I can take my ETH, put it in Aave, get a back loan out of there. It's entirely math. And ETH came up uh, because uh, of, of some math problems. But the entire value chain of a carbon credit is sort of like different. So on crypto Twitter, there is this meme, Bitcoin fixes this. Um, and I think crypto can fix a lot alongside the value chain. So from start to finish, but start to finish, at least from my perspective, will be mostly uh, human-based. So this is sort of like a process improvement, what blockchain can bring to the table. And um, I think Christian touched upon that. So there are, just, there are some things in our value chain, at, at least in the tokenized carbon credit chain, that crypto cannot fix. Um, so these problems are true for the crypto space, but also for the legacy space. So this is this is not something that you can say, hey, it's a blockchain problem. Uh, it's also a legacy problem. And we have to think about this. Uh, this is no competition about the tech, but about the integrity of the entire uh, market, which is crucial to scaling it and to getting to somewhere where the market actually has an impact, why we created the market, right? We want to have the world decarbonized, for example. So we should not argue about the tech, but we are, should argue about, okay, how can we get the integrity integrity of it up as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe one more critical aspect, if I may uh, pitch in here, um, because yes, uh, everyone's talking about the um, the benefits of blockchain and we're all fully aware of it, but just take the transparency argument. I mean, uh, Christian was mentioning just briefly the pooling, you know, uh, or just transparency. I think there's a big difference between like a theoretical transparency and a practical transparency. I mean, you know, I, I can show you a blockchain-based explorer uh, and, and kind of like legitimacy claim that it's all transparent, but it, it's meaningless information for uh, corporations. And I think that's also um, something that, that, you know, we as an industry as a whole need to to work on to kind of like really get out of the intensity uh, of the, um, you know, the childhood years of, of the technology, which indeed has all of the potential, but um, it's, it's not there yet. And I think that is also um, a reason uh, why there's kind of like a lack of corporate adoption. Uh, you can see a clear hesitation to, to get into it. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good point, Wolf, from that, that sort of hurdle that you have to jump over. If you are not from, let's say, a DeFi or crypto space, you've got to get your head around it. But what is a MetaMask? And can I use a MetaMask as a corporation? What the heck is even that? And isn't blockchain bad for the planet? 
And all of these questions, um, these are another level of resistance that digitized carbon assets may have to overcome. Um, and I think there are ways that we can sort of smooth that over, um, you know, by presenting a user experience, which is more familiar, perhaps, than going straight for some sort of DAP approach where you have to start connecting wallets and transacting that way. As beautiful as that could be, and as when you've done it, you realize that it's actually quite simple and it's, and it's fairly harmless, but you still have to offer the other leg as well, because that's how you're going to attract people into being even in a position to consider uh, an on-chain carbon asset. That's exactly what I wanted to touch upon too, because um, I mean, if you think about it, most institutions, if, okay, they got the blockchain picture, but they don't really care about the exact details of the tech, right? So I always make this analogy. So if uh, institutions ask me, okay, on which chain is this running on, for example, and what's the validation process and what's the consensus mechanism of the underlying chain? So for me, the analogy is like sort of like the internet, right? So I don't get on a technical level how the internet works. No, not even, I have no clue, but I know which value it enhances and with, which value it creates. I mean, I'm sitting in the Netherlands, Wolfram, I think you're in Germany, then you're in England. Um, I think Christian, you too, and uh, the other Christian is on a different continent. I get how, what value the internet provides to me right now in this second. And I think we have to come to a state in the market where we are clear on the uh, on the tech and on the standards and on, okay, how can we measure this and how what is the tokenization standard so that we can approach institutions and pitch them sort of like the analogy to the internet. Okay, so here's the blockchain technology, yada, 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 it provides integrity, and then we can approach them. And I think this is ultimately the way that we, or at least we at Dakota, try to bring the market to this stand. And then we can approach the, the big corporations that have very understandably doubts about the integrity of the market right now as is. This is a good point, Max, a really good point. And just to maybe, you know, open the, the door a little bit on, on our decision making process at EarthChain to go on chain. We didn't go on chain so we can say, hey, we're on blockchain and it's sexy and you should come to us. We went on chain because we needed a fractionalization solution that would be very transparent because we want to be in a glass box. Um, and so we, we chose that because it's easier to do that on chain than it is to do it with a, a regular database. If we had to set up a whole bunch of replicated, uh, I don't know, MySQL or Dynamo databases around the world in different data centers that somehow allowed access to our audit logs and all kinds of things, that would be 10 times harder than just plugging in to a low energy blockchain, which was one of the rationales for our choice of using Stellar, for example. Um, it would be much easier just to go with chain. So if you say that, all right, we pick the technology because we want transparency. And now the decision is between traditional database and blockchain. For me, the decision blockchain was very, very easy to make. Mm -hmm. I, actually, just as like a little remark from me, I, I really like the discussion right now because there was like a really good flow on many ideas. Uh, I mean, probably I've also heard it like yesterday, uh, there was another hack with, with Yearn and Ava was also involved. And as most people know, Yearn and Ava are like, I would call it blue chip. DeFi assets because they have been there from I think 2020 uh, DeFi summer, um, and what we saw also I think uh, I'm not sure if it was this year or, or still last year that for example Siemens um, they issued a tokenized bond they raised capital um, via that bond so I feel slowly companies are realizing the potential of blockchain but I guess uh, the general consensus among you guys is still that. Well, it might be still too early, right, for, I think, bigger corporations like, let's say, Volkswagen or Mercedes to really consider um, yeah, any type of trading venue on the blockchain as an alternative, right? Or do you think this could be something in the near future that could be um, a real alternative for, for such kind of players? My experience, I if I talk to institutions, sorry, welcome. My, uh, my experience is that on the demand side, we don't know, we do not have any problems. So the demand side is sky high for carbon credits as a general and even so especially big corporations want to go carbon neutral or carbon negative. But I mean, I have this calls all the time. They ask me, okay, why, why a blockchain? Why do I need blockchain? Is why do I, why don't I just buy the EU ETS, for example? They were way more robust investment case, for example. Um, is the project from Brazil uh, comparable to the one in Germany, for for example? So the market is very opaque, and it is. Um, I mean, uh, Dan talked about okay, do I set up? So I, I got this question actually. So do I set up a MetaMask for my for the entire like corporation, the billion dollar corporation? Do we have one red MetaMask? How are the keys stored? So the entire user experience of onboarding. 
like really big institutions onto tokenized carbon credits, it's not from a supply side, it's not at, a, I, so at least on my side, it's not at a level where we can approach, for example, very big corporations say, hey, this is your wallet. It doesn't have to be a wallet, it can also be a custody solution, for example. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, it's not at a level where we can approach institutions uh, to really um, fulfill their de their very high demand with high quality and high quality credits on a ad adequate uh, user experience. That is my two cents on the demand and supply in the current market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has to be, we kind of like all said it before, it has to be a web true experience powered by Web3 is sometimes what I like to say, just as you mentioned, Dan, you know, it's like, it was the best technology, but um, quite frankly, nobody else cares about the technology. I mean, it has to be hidden behind the scene. It has to be um, matching a company's processes. Um, Max, just as you said, like um, no company I know of, and we've spoken to hundreds too, has a process in place. I mean, handling a, a thing such a wallet you know it's like it, nobody knows how to deal with that and, and and i don't think uh, that will change anytime soon so the only solution to that is um, make it a custodial wallet solution hide it behind the scene uh, don't even think about um, you know forcing the companies uh, to to buy with crypto because that's not going to happen either you know, just, just the regular payment rails, um, the, the regular processes, um, all powered by blockchain in the background. And then I think we will slowly see um, uh, the corporate um, adoption. Because just as you said, demand in general is sky high. But those who are trying to sell the blockchain-based credits right now, they can't find, quite honestly, they can't find buyers because... Um, you know, the security aspects, um, you know, Christian was talking about the hacks, um, you know, there are way too many regulatory aspects. I mean, that's something that Christian maybe can, uh, the other Christian can point on, you know, it's like, what are you even getting if you buy a token? I mean, we know that discussion. So these kinds of questions have, have to be answered. That's what we're also focusing on. That's where we see our role as particular, you know, providing that, that platform that provides all the answers. And unless that happened, um, I personally don't see a corporate ad uh, adoption without that. And um, so, so, so my takeaway is right now a little bit that, I mean, yes, blockchain is not as secure right now and people have to get familiar with it. But uh, what also very often comes up to me is like the, the lack of regulation, right? Like um, what are the rules, who make the rules? But um, maybe like uh, you, Dan, because you're in the working group, uh, also this, this, this gold standard, it, or like, to all of you guys, do you think that the that the registries will play like a key role in basically setting such kind of rules? I know Christian, you also wrote that in your in your article um, that maybe they come up with, with their own trading venues uh, which are blockchain based. Um, are they will they be one of the, the bigger players in the crypto space, or who do you think will basically bring order to the to the chaos? Let's say. I think that the legacy registries, and, and at the moment in particular, gold standard will have a lot to contribute to this. Um, and I believe that gold standard, as, as they've said in their published information about their tokenization readiness phase, they reserve the right to build their own tokenized registry in the future. And why not? You know, if that's where the market will go, then, then that's great. And I think it will be a very good validation of the technology if um, a major registry such as gold standard were to move forward and provide those guidelines in the absence of any sort of, let's say, global or, or, or statewide or, or national regulatory process to ensure that there are walls and there are boundaries around um, the digitization of, of carbon credits. Um, so yeah, I think I think they absolutely have a role to play. And to some extent, that's the role that we've played so far as well in the, in the current sort of normal voluntary carbon market to provide at least some frameworks around it. Now there are other players coming in as well, such as the ICVCM setting standards on the use of carbon credits by corporates. And, you know, I can imagine that that framework can be extended in future as well to say, okay, right, you're a corporate buying digital carbon assets, then here are some additional guidelines and some in additional information that will help you to steer, navigate these waters um, effectively as well. Um, maybe to add one, one more thing to what Dan was saying. Um, 
if a project is very or gold standard uh, approved, it's a very, very big seal of approval, which institutions value very high. So I think if, um, I, I mean, this is a legacy world, but um, I mean, gold standard then talked about this, they're already thinking about tapping into the blockchain market. It really depends, of, it, it depends on if they want to. And I get that they have doubts about, okay, what is blockchain really bringing to the table? They talked about the scandal, you can Google it afterwards. Um, so uh, if they want to, they can play a big role. And I think it would be very valuable for the market if we have them in the uh, in the sort of like tokenized tokenized world. So hopefully um, they are yeah they are they are interested in, in tapping into into tokenization after all, and, and maybe even building their own registry, which I would uh, very much congratulate. I would also go as far as to say, Max, that um, we can use the word legacy, um, but it's not necessarily that they're legacy players. They are the players. They are in yeah. it. And they can add this extra layer of technology on there to in, extend their capabilities. I very much feel that we at EarthChain are standing on the shoulders of giants with what we're doing. We're not throwing away what's gone before, but refining it and making it more accessible and more embeddable and more uh, democratic for ordinary people and consumers to have access to different channels to the carbon market and uh, and begin to uh, begin to play and you know actually contribute to uh, decarbonization and impact. Uh, legacy is the wrong wording. I'm just a crypto native, so uh, excuse my. I'm excuse but my it's French okay. I'm, I'm a startup <laughs> fintech native as well, and I always talk about legacy banks. But honestly, yeah, yeah. the legacy banks that I want to get involved with because they're the big players. They are the players. They are the banks. Maybe I can can add here. So I think the most fascinating thing from my personal perspective is here. The only thing which is really for sure is that. Um, the climate targets are increasing so everybody has to reduce greenhouse gas emission and everything down it is totally open so I, I, I assume that a lot of institutions will become some kind of buyer seller actor or whatever the intermediates they, they can't ignore blockchain technology I'm pretty sure they have to use it in some way other way uh, the benefits and transparency immutability uh, tracking and all the things are absolutely clear and Important, especially in the carbon credit. And uh, as far as I understand, so I'm serving blockchain developments a long time now, so I'm not an expert in all these uh, fields, but I think this carbon credit sector now is really the sector where I see first time real benefit <laughs> in, in this whole technology, you know? So this is what I see here. And uh, it was really makes sense from the beginning to the end. So this is, but it's, uh, excuse me, I'm not aware of all aspects of blockchain and crypto sphere, but it's what I see. So from my, my perspective, what I think is interesting um, to watch out a bit in the future where the things are going maybe. I, I think interesting is, so we have this exploding uh, voluntary carbon markets. Uh, question for me is here, are they as some kind of uh, first step for more mandatory carbon markets, which will evolve from voluntary carbon markets to mandatory carbon from the global Paris Agreement architecture and landscape, I can make this assumption, maybe, I don't know, uh, might be might be possible. The other important thing for me, which I see now is um, which kind of uh, developments or direction do we see where carbon credits and all these different types of carbon credits are directing now. So what are the most, which one have the most value in the future? So, um, and then you have to set up, okay, for instance, the, the renewable energy certificates, you have to, you have to ask, okay, one basic reason, uh, or one basic criteria for, um, carbon credits is additionality, for instance, if the normal market is not, um, giving the finance basics uh, or cannot finance a project, then ca emitting carbon credit makes sense to give this additional value. But if you have projects which don't need this additional incentive, it doesn't, the whole idea does not make sense. Here. So, and, and this is an important criteria I see here when we talk about where, which carbon credits in the future are most important and probably will be tokenized and will be very valuable as well for companies and others. The other big risk, as I said before, I'm not so close to big corporates or institution here, but I think the reputation issue you cannot ignore. I think it's pretty important for a lot of big companies if they turned out, okay, carbon credit seems to be a bit shady or I don't know. So, uh, and, and they really take a distance or wait a bit before they really make big investment into the things until some kind of high um, integrity uh, standards are achieved, which are common agreed. Uh, uh, and that's why I think what the Paris Agreement will uh, finally decide it will be a crucial baseline for, for a lot of other standard and certification all around the world. 
Mm -hmm. That would somebody from the rest of the audience still, uh, from the panelists still add something because you're very close to the end, but uh, obviously I would give everybody still the chance to say something to that. Perfect. So those were famous last words. Yeah. Okay, I, because I, that's also what I thought. I thought this was like a perfect, a perfect ending. But what I also, what I'm thinking right now is one hour was way too short. I feel like we, we could be discussing this for another one or two hours and we still wouldn't be really at the end. But uh, I have to say, I learned a lot today. And I will really dig into, um, um, yeah, Dan, basically what you said about the, the different uh, Web3 application. I will definitely take a look at that. Um, to all the audience, I can uh, recommend uh, taking a look at also at Christian's article called Climate Protection with the Web3. I think you will find it also when you enter his name. I know that Wolfram and Maximilian, uh, they also publish a lot of articles on Medium. I would also recommend reading uh, those. And I think um, with all four together, probably you will have a fairly good overview about the current state of, or let's say like some overview about the current state of uh, carbon credits trading um, on the blockchain. Okay, like Maximilian is nodding. So I think this was not completely wrong what I said. <laughs> But um, yeah, as I said, uh, we just came to an end. I would suggest um, maybe we just look for in like half a year, six, seven months, and maybe we could organize another panel because I thought that was really, really interesting. And uh, for now, I would just like uh, to thank you guys all for participating. Uh, it was a really pleasant discussion that we had. And yeah, also a nice weekend. Thanks, Thanks for man. being here. Okay. Right. Thanks for the invite. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.